THE CHESSMEN OF MARS CHAPTER FOUR This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Weiss THE CHESSMEN OF MARS by Edgar Rice Burroughs CHAPTER FOUR CAPTURED as Thuria, swift racer of the night, shot again into the sky, the scene changed. As by magic a new aspect fell athwart the face of nature, it was as though in the instant one had been transported from one planet to another. It was the age-old miracle of the Martian nights that is always new, even to Martians. Two moons resplendent in the heavens, where one had been but now conflicting fast-changing shadows that altered the very hills themselves. Far Cluros, stately, majestic, almost stationary, shedding his steady light upon the world below. Thuria, a great and glorious orb, swinging swift across the vaulted dome of the blue-black night, so low that she seemed to graze the hills, a gorgeous spectacle that held the girl now beneath the spell of its enchantment, as it always had and always would. "'Ah, Thuria, mad queen of heaven,' murmured Tyra of Helium. The hills pass in stately procession, their bosoms rising and falling. The trees move in restless circles. The little grasses describe their little arcs, and all is movement, restless, mysterious movement without sound, while Thuria passes. The girl sighed, and let her gaze fall again to the stern realities beneath. There was no mystery in the huge bonds. He who had discovered her squatted there, looking hungrily up at her. Most of the others had wandered away in search of other prey, but a few remained, hoping yet to bury their fangs in that soft body. The night wore on. Again Thuria left the heavens to her lord and master, hurrying on to keep her tryst with the sun in other skies. But as Singobanth waited impatiently beneath the tree which harbored Terra of Helium. The others had left, but their roars and growls and moans thundered or rumbled or floated back to her from near and far. What prey found they in this little valley? There must be something that they were accustomed to find here that they should be drawn in so great numbers. The girl wondered what it could be. How long the night! Numb, cold, and exhausted, Tara of Helium clung to the tree in growing desperation. For once she had dozed and almost fallen. Hope was low in her brave little heart. How much more could she endure? She asked herself the question, and then, with a brave shake of her head, she squared her shoulders. I still live, she said aloud. The Banth looked up and growled. Came Thuria again and after a while the great sun, a flaming lover, pursuing his heart's desire. And Cluros, the cold husband, continued his serene way, as placid as before his house had been violated by this hot Lothario. And now the sun and both moons rode together in the sky, lending their far mysteries to make weird the Martian dawn. Tara of Helium looked out across the fair valley that spread upon all sides of her, it was rich and beautiful, but even as she looked upon it she shuddered, for to her mind came a picture of the headless things that the towers and the walls hid, those by day and the baths by night. Ah, was it any wonder that she shuddered? With the coming of the sun the great Barsoomian lion rose to his feet. He turned angry eyes upon the girl above him, voiced a single ominous growl, and slunk away toward the hills. The girl watched him, and she saw that he gave the towers as wide a berth as possible, and that he never took his eyes from one of them while he was passing it. Evidently the inmates had taught these savage creatures to respect them. Presently he passed from sight in a narrow defile, nor in any direction that she could see was there another. Momentarily, at least, the landscape was deserted. The girl wondered if she dared to attempt to regain the hills and her flyer, 
She dreaded the coming of the workmen to the fields, as she was sure they would come. She shrank from again seeing the headless bodies, and found herself wondering if these things would come out into the fields and work. She looked toward the nearest tower. There was no sign of life there. The valley lay quiet now, and deserted. She lowered herself stiffly to the ground. Her muscles were cramped, and every move brought a twinge of pain. Pausing a moment to drink again at the stream, she felt refreshed, and then turned without more delay toward the hills. To cover the distance as quickly as possible seemed the only plan to pursue. The trees no longer offered concealment, and so she did not go out of her way to be near them. The hills seemed very far away. She had not thought, the night before, that she had traveled so far. Really, it had not been far, but now, with the three towers to pass in broad daylight, the distance seemed great indeed. The second tower lay almost directly in her path. To make a detour would not lessen the chance of detection, it would only lengthen the period of her danger, and so she laid her course straight for the hill where her flyer was, regardless of the tower. As she passed the first enclosure she thought that she heard the sound of movement within, but the gate did not open and she breathed more easily when it lay behind her. She came then to the second enclosure, the outer wall of which she must circle as it lay across her route. As she passed close along it she distinctly heard not only movement within, but voices. In the world language of Barsoom she heard a man issuing instructions. So many were to pick Usa, so many were to irrigate this field, so many to cultivate that, and so on, as a foreman laid out the day's work for his crew. Tara of Helium had just reached the gate in the outer wall. Without warning it swung open toward her. She saw that for a moment it would hide her from those within, and in that moment she turned and ran, keeping close to the wall until, passing out of sight beyond the curve of the structure, she came to the opposite side of the enclosure. Here, panting from her exertion and from the excitement of her narrow escape, she threw herself among some tall weeds that grew close to the foot of the wall. There she lay, trembling for some time not even daring to raise her head and look about. Never before had Tara of Helium felt the paralyzing effects of terror. She was shocked and angry at herself that she, daughter of John Carter, warlord of Barsoom, should exhibit fear. Not even the fact that there had been none there to witness it lessened her shame and anger, and the worst of it was she knew that under similar circumstances she would again be equally as craven. It was not the fear of death, she knew that. No, it was the thought of those headless bodies, and that she might see them, and that they might even touch her, lay hands upon her, seize her. She shuddered and trembled at the thought. After a while she gained sufficient command of herself to raise her head and look about. To her horror she discovered that everywhere she looked she saw people working in the fields or preparing to do so. Workmen were coming from other towers. Little bands were passing to this field and that. They were even some already at work, within thirty ads of her, about a hundred yards. There were ten, perhaps, in the party nearest her, both men and women, and all were beautiful of form and grotesque of face. So meager was their trappings that they were practically naked, a fact that was in no way remarkable among the tillers of the fields of Mars. Each wore the peculiar high leather collar that completely hid the neck, and each wore sufficient other leather to support a single sword and a pocket pouch. The leather was very old and worn, showing long, hard service, and was absolutely plain with the exception of a single device upon the left shoulder. The heads, however, were covered with ornaments of precious metals and jewels, so that little more than eyes, nose, and mouth were discernible. These were hideously inhuman, and yet grotesquely human, at the same time. The eyes were far apart and protruding. The nose, scarce more than two small parallel slits, set vertically above a round hole that was the mouth. The heads were peculiarly repulsive 
so much so that it seemed unbelievable to the girl that they formed an integral part of the beautiful bodies below them. So fascinated was Tara of Helium that she could scarce take her eyes from the strange creatures, a fact that was to prove her undoing, for in order that she might see them she was forced to expose a part of her own head, and presently, to her consternation, she saw that one of the creatures had stopped his work and was staring directly at her. She did not dare move, for it was still possible that the thing had not seen her, or at least was only suspicious that some creature lay hid among the weeds. If she could allay this suspicion by remaining motionless, the creature might believe that he had been mistaken and returned to his work. But, alas, such was not to be the case. She saw the thing call the attention of others to her, and almost immediately four or five of them started to move in her direction. It was impossible now to escape discovery. Her only hope lay in flight. If she could elude them and reach the hills and the flyer ahead of them she might escape, and that could be accomplished in but one way, flight immediate and swift. Leaping to her feet, she darted along the base of the wall, which she must skirt to the opposite side, beyond which lay the hill that was her goal. Her act was greeted by strange whistling sounds from the things behind her, and casting a glance over her shoulder she saw them all in rapid pursuit. There were also shrill commands that she halt, but to these she paid no attention. Before she had half circled the enclosure she discovered that her chances for successful escape were great since it was evident to her that her pursuers were not so fleet as she. High indeed, then, were her hopes as she came in sight of the hill, but they were soon dashed by what lay before her, for there, in the fields that lay between, were fully a hundred creatures similar to those behind her, and all were on the alert, evidently warned by the whistling of their fellows. Instructions and commands were shouted to and fro, with the result that those before her spread roughly into a great half-circle to intercept her, and when she turned to the right, hoping to elude the net, she saw others coming from the fields beyond, and to the left the same was true. But Tara of Helium would not admit defeat. Without once pausing she turned directly toward the center of the advancing semicircle, beyond which lay her single chance of escape, and as she ran she drew her long, slim dagger. Like her valiant sire, if die she must, she would die fighting. There were gaps in the thin line confronting her, and toward the widest of one of these she directed her course. The things on either side of the opening guessed her intent, for they closed in to place themselves in her path. This widened the openings on either side of them, and as the girl appeared almost to rush into their arms she turned suddenly at right angles, ran swiftly in the new direction for a few yards, and then dashed quickly toward the hill again. Now only a single warrior with a wide gap on either side of him barred her clear way to freedom, though all the others were speeding as rapidly as they could to intercept her. If she could pass this one without too much delay she could escape, of that she was certain. Her every hope hinged on this. The creature before her realized it too, for he moved cautiously though swiftly to intercept her, as a rugby fullback might maneuver in the realization that he alone stood between the opposing team and a touchdown. At first Tara of Helium had hoped that she might dodge him, for she could not but guess that she was not only more fleet but infinitely more agile than these strange creatures but soon there came to her the realization that in the time consumed in an attempt to elude his grasp his nearer fellows would be upon her and escape then impossible, so she chose instead to charge straight for him, and when he guessed her decision he stood, half crouching and with outstretched arms, awaiting her. In one hand was his sword, but a voice arose crying in tones of authority, "'Take her alive! Do not harm her!' Instantly the fellow returned his sword to its scabbard, and then Tara of Helium was upon him. Straight for that beautiful body she sprang, and in the instant that the arms closed to seize her, her sharp blade drove deep into the naked chest. The impact hurled them both to the ground, 
and as Tara of Helium sprang to her feet again she saw, to her horror, that the loathsome head had rolled from the body and was now crawling away from her on six short spider-like legs. The body struggled spasmodically and lay still. As brief as had been the delay caused by the encounter, it still had been of sufficient duration to undo her, for even as she rose two more of the things fell upon her, and instantly thereafter she was surrounded. Her blade sank once more into the naked flesh, and once more a head rolled free and crawled away. Then they overpowered her, and in another moment she was surrounded by fully a hundred of the creatures, all seeking to lay hands upon her. At first she thought that they wished to tear her to pieces in revenge for her having slain two of their fellows, but presently she realized that they were prompted more by curiosity than by any sinister motive. Come, said one of her captors, both of whom had retained a hold upon her. As he spoke, he tried to lead her away with him toward the nearest tower. She belongs to me, cried the other. Did not I capture her? She will come with me to the Tower of Moak. Never, insisted the first. She is Lud's. To Lud I will take her, and whosoever interferes may feel the keenness of my sword in the head. He almost shouted the last three words. Come, enough of this, cried one who spoke with some show of authority. She was captured in Lud's fields. She will go to Lud. She was discovered in Moak's fields, at the very foot of the Tower of Moak, insisted he who had claimed her for Moak. "'You have heard the Nolok speak,' cried the Lud. "'It shall be as he says.' "'Not while this Moak holds a sword,' replied the other. "'Rather will I cut her in twain and take my half to Moak than relinquish her all to Lud.' And he drew his sword, or rather he laid his hand upon its hilt in a threatening gesture. But before ever he could draw it, the Lud had whipped his out and with a fearful blow cut deep into the head of his adversary. Instantly the big round head collapsed, almost as a punctured balloon collapses, as a grayish semi-fluid matter spurted from it. The protruding eyes, apparently lidless, merely stared. The sphincter-like muscle of the mouth opened and closed, and then the head toppled from the body to the ground. The body stood dully for a moment, and then slowly started to wander aimlessly about until one of the others seized it by the arm. One of the two heads crawling about on the ground now approached. "'This Rykor belongs to Moke,' it said. "'I am a Moke. I will take it.' And without further discussion it commenced to crawl up the front of the headless body, using its six short spider-like legs and two stout kela, which grew just in front of its legs and strongly resembled those of an earthly lobster, except that they were both of the same size. The body, in the meantime, stood in passive indifference, its arms hanging idly at its sides. The head climbed to the shoulders and settled itself inside the leather collar that now hid its kela and legs. Almost immediately the body gave evidence of intelligent animation. It raised its hands and adjusted the collar more comfortably. It took the head between its palms and settled it in place, and when it moved around it did not wander aimlessly, but instead its steps were firm and to some purpose. The girl watched all these things in growing wonder, and presently no other of the Mokes seeming inclined to dispute the right of the Lud to her, she was led off by her captor toward the nearest tower. Several accompanied them, including one who carried the loose head under his arm. The head that was being carried conversed with the head upon the shoulders of the thing that carried it. Tara of Helium shivered. It was horrible. All that she had seen of these frightful creatures was horrible, and to be a prisoner wholly in their power. Shadow of her first ancestor, what had she done to deserve so cruel a fate? At the wall enclosing the tower they paused, while one opened the gate, and then they passed within the enclosure, which, to the girl's horror, she found filled with headless bodies. The creature who carried the bodiless head now set its burden upon the ground and the latter immediately crawled toward one of the bodies that was lying nearby. 
Some wandered stupidly to and fro, but this one lay still. It was a female. The head crawled to it and made its way to the shoulders where it settled itself. At once the body sprang lightly erect. Another of those who had accompanied them from the fields approached with the harness and collar that had been taken from the dead body that the head had formerly topped. The new body now appropriated these, and the hands deftly adjusted them. The creature was now as good as before Tara of Helium had struck down its former body with her slim blade, but there was a difference. Before it had been male. Now it was female. That, however, seemed to make no difference to the head. In fact, Tara of Helium had noticed during the scramble and the fight about her that sex differences seemed of little moment to her captors. Males and females had taken equal part in her pursuit. Both were identically harnessed, and both carried swords, and she had seen as many females as males draw their weapons at the moment that a quarrel between the two factions seemed imminent. The girl was given but brief opportunity for further observation of the pitiful creatures in the enclosure, as her captor, after having directed the others to return to the fields, led her toward the tower, which they entered, passing into an apartment about ten feet wide and twenty long, in one end of which was a stairway leading to an upper level, and in the other an opening to a similar stairway leading downward. The chamber, though on a level with the ground, was brilliantly lighted by windows in its inner wall, the light coming from a circular court in the center of the tower. The walls of this court appeared to be faced with what resembled glazed white tile, and the whole interior of it was flooded with dazzling light, a fact which immediately explained to the girl the purpose of the glass prisms of which the domes were constructed. The stairways themselves were sufficient to cause remark, since in nearly all Barsoomian architecture inclined runways are utilized for purposes of communication between different levels, and especially is this true of the more ancient forms and of those of remote districts where fewer changes have come to alter the customs of antiquity. Down the stairway her captor led Tara of Helium, down and down, through chambers still lighted from the brilliant wall. Occasionally they passed others going in the opposite direction, and these always stopped to examine the girl and ask questions of her captor. I know nothing but that she was found in the fields, and that I caught her after a fight in which she slew two Rikors, and in which I slew a Moke, and that I take her to Lud, to whom, of course, she belongs. If Lud wishes to question her, that is for Lud to do, not for me. Thus always he answered the curious. Presently they reached a room from which a circular tunnel led away from the tower, and into this the creature conducted her. The tunnel was some seven feet in diameter, and flattened on the bottom to form a walk. For a hundred feet from the tower it was lined with the same tile-like material of the light well, and amply illuminated by reflected light from that source. Beyond it was faced with stone of various shapes and sizes, neatly cut and fitted together, a very fine mosaic, without a pattern. There were branches, too, and other tunnels which crossed this, and occasionally openings not more than a foot in diameter, these latter being usually close to the floor. Above each of these smaller openings was painted a different device, while upon the walls of the larger tunnels, at all intersections and points of convergence, hieroglyphics appeared. These the girl could not read, though she guessed that they were the names of the tunnels, or notices indicating that points to which they led. She tried to study some of them out but there was not a character that was familiar to her, which seemed strange, since, while the written languages of the various nations of Barsoom differ, it still is true that they have many characters and words in common. She had tried to converse with her guard, but he had not seemed inclined to talk with her, and she finally desisted. She could not but note that he had offered her no indignities, nor had he been either unnecessarily rough or in any way cruel. The fact that she had slain two of the bodies with her dagger had apparently aroused no animosity, 
or desire for revenge in the minds of the strange heads that surmounted the bodies, even those whose bodies had been killed. She did not try to understand it, since she could not approach the peculiar relationship between the heads and the bodies of these creatures from the basis of any past knowledge or experience of her own. So far their treatment of her seemed to augur naught that might arouse her fears. Perhaps, after all, she had been fortunate to fall into the hands of these strange people, who might not only protect her from harm, but even aid her in returning to Helium. That they were repulsive and uncanny she could not forget, but if they meant her no harm she could at least overlook their repulsiveness. Renewed hope aroused within her a spirit of greater cheerfulness, and it was almost blithely now that she moved at the side of her weird companion. She even caught herself humming a gay little tune that was then popular in Helium. The creature at her side turned its expressionless eyes upon her. "'What is that noise that you are making?' it asked. "'I was but humming an air,' she replied. "'Humming an air,' he repeated. "'I do not know what you mean. But do it again. I like it. This time she sang the words while her companion listened intently. His face gave no indication of what was passing in that strange head. It was as devoid of expression as that of a spider. It reminded her of a spider. When she had finished, he turned toward her again. That was different, he said. I like that better even than the other. How do you do it? Why, she said, it is singing. Do you not know what song is? No, he replied. Tell me how you do it. It is difficult to explain, she told him, since any explanation of it presupposes some knowledge of melody and of music, while your very question indicates that you have no knowledge of either. No, he said, I do not know what you are talking about, but tell me how you do it. It is merely the melodious modulations of my voice, she explained. Listen. And again she sang. I do not understand, he insisted, but I like it. Could you teach me to do it? I do not know, but I should be glad to try. We will see what Lud does with you, he said. If he does not want you, I will keep you and you shall teach me to make sounds like that. At his request, she sang again as they continued their way along the winding tunnel, which was now lighted by occasional bulbs which appeared to be similar to the radium bulbs with which she was familiar and which were common to all the nations of Barsoom, insofar as she knew, having been perfected at so remote a period that their very origin was lost in antiquity. They consist, usually, of a hemispherical bowl of heavy glass in which is packed a compound containing what, according to John Carter, must be radium. The bowl is then cemented into a metal plate with a heavily insulated back and the whole affair set in the masonry of the wall or ceiling as desired, where it gives off light of greater or less intensity according to the composition of the filling material for an almost incalculable period of time. As they proceeded they met a greater number of the inhabitants of this underground world and the girl noted that among many of these the metal and harness were more ornate than had been those of the workers in the fields above. The heads and bodies, however, were similar, even identical, she thought. No one offered her harm, and she was now experiencing a feeling of relief, almost akin to happiness, when her guide turned suddenly into an opening on the right side of the tunnel, and she found herself in a large, well-lighted chamber. This is the end of The Chessmen of Mars, Chapter 4, by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Recording by Tom Weiss.